Back in 2007, Nicolas Cage graced our screens with his interpretation of the Johnny Blaze Ghostwriter from Marvel Comics. Despite how you feel about that film, it did spawn a tie-in video game as a way to further cash in on the movie's hype, allowing fans to step into the boots of Ghost Rider and dish out vengeance against the damned. This Ghost Rider game was published by 2K Games and developed by Climax Action. Climax Action was a subsidiary company of Climax Studios, who are probably best known as the developers of Silent Hill Origins and Silent Hill Shattered Memories. Looking at Climax's catalog of games, it seems that they've had a lot of experience with other licensed games such as SpongeBob SquarePants Super Sponge, Power Rangers Time Force, and The Italian Job prior to taking on Ghost Rider. To help pen the narrative of Ghost Rider, Climax enlisted the help of two noteworthy Marvel Comics writers, Garth Ennis and Jimmy Palmiotti. We just discussed them in the Punisher Retrospective, another game where they wrote the story. Although I think you'll find that these two games feel very different, despite being written by the same people. Some of that probably boils down to the ESRB ratings of the two games though, and how much leeway this provided the writers to take things in a darker direction. The Punisher game was rated as M for Mature, with hardly any punches pulled as far as censorship. Ghost Rider had to be a T-rated game since the movie was PG-13, which apparently went against Garth Ennis' instincts. In one of the game's making of collectibles, lead designer Sam Barlow describes how it was working with Ennis and Palmiotti, as well as how Garth was turning in very graphic scenes that needed to be toned down. Garth really likes his gore. It's obviously the Ghost Rider movie is a T-rated movie, so the game has to be a T-rated game. We'd get these scripts back from Garth. So, Love what you've done here, this is brilliant. Ripping Caretaker's face off. Crucify Caretaker. Don't know if they um, had issues with that character or something. Impaling people on church steeples, burning people at the stake, eye gougings. We're not really sure you can do that in a team rated game. We'd ring them up and we'd say, Garth, I'm sorry, we can't crucify the caretaker, we can't impale him on a church steeple, you know, we need to tone this down a little bit. Jimmy kind of took on the role of the elder brother who sort of kept Garth under control and helped us tone down some of the script. So it was interesting seeing the two of them work together in producing the script. Honestly, I would have loved to have seen all of those elements that Garth outlined make it into the final game. That darker, more brutal world would have packed a lot of punch for the story and would have fit a character like Ghost Rider. One thing everyone could agree on, though, was that the Ghost Rider game should take place after the events of the movie. This allows the writers more freedom with the story and puts the player right into the middle of the action as Ghost Rider. In another one of the collectible videos, Sam Barlow discusses this decision as well as some of their early thoughts. In my case, um, it all started with the comics. Um, you know, my boss came in and said, we're looking at making a Ghost Rider game, at uh, which point I got quite excited. So at that point, I went away and I read the rest of the comics, every single one of them. Then I read the script for the movie, um, chatted to some of the movie guys, got a feel for what they were doing with the movie, the sort of horror western. And we then got together with the publisher and we brought in two Marvel writers, Jimmy Palmiotti and Garth Ennis. So we had this big round table discussion, uh, during which you decide what stuff is definitely going to be in the game. You know, it's all very high level. Ghost Rider has to ride a bike at some point. Um, you never want to play as Johnny Blaze. It's never quite as much fun to play the alter ego. I think from day one we wanted to always be the Ghost Rider. Because we were going for a sequel to the actual movie storyline, we wanted to draw in some of the characters from the comics. This is the first true Ghost Rider video game. So we wanted to make sure that there was a bridge between the movie Ghost Rider and the comic Ghost Rider. We decided early on was to avoid having much in the way of puzzles. It always strikes me as a bit odd when you have these super powerful characters take on giant 20 foot tall demons. But, you know, he has to run around and push blocks, tiptoe across a rope or climb up a ledge, push lots of blocks around to make a nice pattern or something. For me, that kind of ruins this whole thing of being a super powerful dude. And I think we've achieved that with Ghost Rider. I personally think this was the right place to start, and I'm glad that they acknowledged the comics instead of heavily emphasizing the movie. At this early stage, it feels like there's a lot of passion to get Ghost Rider right, as well as a lot of excitement to adapt such an iconic character. So, their heart was in the right place, and as we go through this video, we'll discuss how their plan was executed. Before we get into the story though, Ghost Rider ended up releasing on PlayStation 2, PSP, and Game Boy Advance. For whatever reason, it was also planned to release on Xbox, but was later cancelled. In this video though, we'll be discussing the PlayStation 2 version of the game, while also briefly looking at the PSP version, since there are some interesting differences. All of the gameplay you'll see throughout this video come from the PS2 version, but are also upscaled through an emulation software called PCSX2. I did get some minor visual bugs due to the upscaling, so you might notice some of them throughout this video, but I decided to still use the upscaled footage since it looks so much cleaner compared to the standard resolution. But with that said, let's look at what Ennis and Palmiotti gave us with the story. Johnny Blaze. Kid was a stuntman. A damn good one. Jumping bikes through flaming hoops. All sorts. 
But nothing he did could save his father from the cancer that consumed him. That is, until Johnny met a stranger who offered him a deal, curing his father's cancer for his mortal soul. And his father's illness did disappear, just in time for him to die a faster death. It was the demon lord, Mephisto, who had cheated Johnny Blaze and transformed him into the Ghost Rider. Now Johnny sees no rest. When called, he must become the Rider and exact vengeance on those who spill the blood of the innocents. The devil needs an agent in the world of men, and never more so than now, for the apocalypse is suddenly at hand. Johnny Blaze still thinks his destiny is his own. I want a word with him below, where even angels' eyes are blind. As you wish, I will bring the Ghost Rider to you. So now Johnny is in hell. too pleased about it. Even though this game's story takes place after the events of the movie, our opening cinematic gives us a brief recap of Johnny Blaze's origin story, just in case you didn't see the movie. Since the game is tied to the movie, we do occasionally see the likenesses of some of the actors from the film, as we can see with Johnny Blaze's father on the poster. We'll see more recognizable faces of film actors throughout the story, but it's interesting that they decided not to make Johnny Blaze resemble Nicolas Cage. I ultimately liked the decision to distance this Johnny Blaze from the movie version anyway, so I didn't mind it. It's also interesting that they decided to make the cinematics look more like comic panels than actual in-game cutscenes. Although the idea of using comic panels to tell the story of a comic character in a game sounds good on paper, I didn't find it to be engaging at all and it kind of distanced me from the story. I'm sure this was due to a small budget and tight deadlines, but it's still kind of disappointing and lackluster overall. I also felt myself zoning out unintentionally during these cutscenes, so just in case you did the same thing, I'll try and recap what we saw. Even though she's not explicitly mentioned here, Johnny Blaze is saying goodbye to his girlfriend, Roxanne Simpson, before going on a bike ride. Unbeknownst to Johnny, Mephisto has some kind of devious intention for Ghost Rider, and tasks another rider named Vengeance to chase Johnny down and send him to hell so that they can chat. By the way, you may be more familiar with this image of Mephisto from the comics and other games, but since this game is tied to the movie, we'll be seeing the Peter Fonda version of Mephisto throughout the game instead of the more classic, devilish design. But with Johnny in Hell, he transforms into Ghost Rider, and this begins our first gameplay section as we fight our way through Hell. We'll talk a lot more about the combat a little later in the video, but it mostly boils down to chaining as many combos together as you can without getting hit. As you do so, you'll progress through different levels of the Vengeance bar, like Damned, Condemned, and Brutal, with Vengeance being the highest one. Doing so helps you obtain larger quantities of Demon Souls, which are released from enemies after being defeated. Demon Souls determine your skill rankings at the end of the level, and are also used as points for the upgrade store, both of which we'll get into later as well. The Vengeance bar is the backbone of the combat system, so you'll see that fluctuating often throughout the game. For now though, we'll continue fighting our way through Hell. The level design itself is pretty decent for the most part. I like the gothic architecture, the waterfalls of lava, an overall decrepit atmosphere that I'd expect from a hell level. It's simple, but I think it does the trick. Since this is our first level, we're also pitted against some basic enemy types like these standard demons and some hell birds eventually culminating into a small scale boss fight against this giant demon. I'm not sure how I feel about those spiky nipples, but I like the design overall for this creature and the rest of the hell demons. Nobody here is too difficult either, which I think is good since it helps you to learn the basics of combat without becoming too overwhelmed. But after beating this giant hell demon, we're on to the next level which introduces us to Ghost Rider's motorcycle. For these missions, you're set on a linear path where you'll have to shoot distant enemies and fight the ones that are riding up next to you, all while dodging certain obstacles. For example, you'll have to power down to slide underneath objects or perform various types of death-defying jumps, referencing Johnny Blaze's past as a motorcycle stuntman. I think the motorcycle levels ended up being some of my favorite missions due to their fast-paced nature, and I'm glad that Climax Action decided to utilize the bike instead of making the game strictly combat-focused. But after making our way to our desired destination, we need to fight our way through more demons in this big arena. After beating them, we finally get our meeting with Mephisto. 
Mephisto informs us that even though we stopped his son Blackheart from accomplishing his goal of unleashing Hell on Earth in the movie, Mephisto's demons are returning to Earth themselves to finish what Blackheart couldn't. So Mephisto needs the Ghost Rider to return to Earth and clear it of demons, otherwise this will set forth the apocalypse and the end of the world. If that wasn't enough, Mephisto also tells Vengeance to go find Roxanne and kill her, and this leads us into our first legitimate boss fight against Vengeance. Instead of duking it out against Vengeance, this entire boss fight occurs on the bike. To damage him, we can blast him with our Hellfire shotgun mounted to the bike, or we'll occasionally end up next to him and whip him with the chain. This boss fight may not seem like much, but it ended up being pretty enjoyable. It's also a quick boss fight, since I think it took maybe two minutes to defeat him. This brings us to San Venganza, where the climax of the film took place. It seems this is where the demons have picked up where Blackheart left off, so it's time for us to investigate. San Venganza was one of my favorite locations from the movie with its Old West spooky ghost town feel, and I think the level designers nailed the atmosphere. When we first arrive though, it seems that someone has blocked our path with some kind of elemental magic, so we have to find a way to gain control of it. To do so, we continue deeper into the abandoned town of San Venganza and enter the saloon. Here we're jumped by more demons leading us into a supernatural bar fight. A lot of levels feel confined and linear in this game, but having a fight take place in an old western bar felt perfect, and this might be amongst my favorite levels in the game, mostly due to the level design. It's especially fun watching all of the wooden chairs, tables, and even the piano eventually get destroyed as the fight progresses. After our bar fight though, we go back outside, and Ghost Rider gets creative with how to handle another blocked path. As we continue through San Venganza, we eventually find an old mine that houses an earth elemental demon. He's a lot like the first giant demon we fought in hell, so he's not too tough to defeat. After doing so, we claim his soul, which allows us to control earth magic. From here, we backtrack through each level that led us here, until we return to the spot where we found that original blocked path. With the earth soul though, we can finally move forward. From here, we find Lilith aboard a train. She mentions that they've reclaimed Blackheart's body and intend to revive him so that they can rule over Hell on Earth together as king and queen. Naturally, Ghost Rider springs into action to stop Lilith. This leads to our next boss fight aboard the train. Lilith uses her sorcery to conjure lightning strikes at us while we hold off swarms of her minions. This fight can be pretty challenging since it's easy to get overwhelmed by enemies, but it's a pretty simplistic fight overall. You pretty much just dodge Lilith's blasts until she accidentally depowers herself and then spam as many attacks on her as you can. When her health gets low enough, you'll move on to the next train car and repeat that process. Still, it's a fun boss fight for what it is, and it felt rewarding taking her down. But as we'll see, she won't go down easy. <laughs> End of the line, Ghost Rider. Johnny survived the explosion. Unfortunately, so did some of Lilith's minions, the Lilin. They took Blackheart's rotten corpse. Time to wake up, Sleeping Beauty. Brought some help. This is Blade. Don't worry, his bite's worse than his bark. Morning, sunshine. He's gonna go fetch Blackheart's body for us. You got more pressing matters to attend to. Problems? Yeah, listen up. Blackout's hooked up with Death Watch and the Demon Ninjas. They hit the army base at Fort Nelson last night. And? From there, they can set off Armageddon at the touch of a button. Blackout. I was hoping you'd do that. Blackout will die by my hands. Time to hit the road, ladies. There was a lot going on in that cutscene, so let's double back for a moment. While we were knocked out, the Lilin were able to steal Blackheart's body, which will be important later. When Johnny wakes up, we see the caretaker as well as the vampire hunter, Blade. Blade making a cameo appearance wasn't expected, but I love to see him. It's not unusual for Blade and Ghost Rider to appear in each other's comics though, and they were also original members of the Midnight Suns team in the comics, a team that focuses on more mystical and supernatural threats. So he's definitely a welcome inclusion, and one that we'll be discussing more throughout the video. Blade's task at this point though is to track down Blackheart's body, while we investigate the emergence of another villain, Blackout. Blackout has teamed up with the villain Death Watch and stormed an army base, so Ghost Rider immediately heads to that base to confront Blackout. Although Death Watch was mentioned too, he never appears in the game outside of being a multiplayer character on the PSP version. I'm sure he was initially planned to be in the game, but for whatever reason didn't make the cut. It's even more strange that he wasn't included though, since his ninja henchmen still show up throughout the game. 
These ninja henchmen are probably the coolest enemies that will fight in the game, so I'm glad they weren't cut out too, but it makes me wonder if a Death Watch boss fight would have been a real highlight. Regardless, we continue to fight our way through the military base until we find the next elemental demon, this time for the Water Soul. These elemental demons are interesting because they are presumably loosely based on the elemental demons from the movie named The Hidden. The three members of The Hidden are Gressel, who controls the earth, Abagor, who controls the air, and Wallow, who controls the water. In one of the developer interviews for the game, it's mentioned that this water elemental originally had a much different design, and he refers to it as Wallow. Okay, this is a fairly uh, early version of Wallow. It was our water elemental. You see in the final game, this is changed to the, this kind of techno Wallow that teleports and fires these huge beams of electricity at, at the player. We felt that the player, the character needed complete rework, and we were really pleased with the final result, the teleporting. I actually like the original design a lot better, and it makes me wonder if the other elemental demons originally had different designs as well. Still, I don't hate the final designs that Climax landed on, and I really enjoy the power set that this Wallow has, and I think he's one of the more challenging minions in the game. After beating him though, we claim the Water Soul, which allows us to control water magic, as well as ride our motorcycle on water. With the Water Soul in hand, we backtrack through the last couple levels until we reach a door that is blocked with a barricade of water. With the Water Soul, we remove it and confront Blackout. Ghost Rider found Blackout waiting on the water. The vampire had helped himself to some of the military's hardware for a quick getaway. Ghost Rider! Ready for a watery grave? Once I'm done with you, I'm headed to the city. Some friends of mine are calling on Roxanne, and I want to make sure they know how to treat a lady. We'll see. Like Vengeance, the blackout boss fight occurs while on the bike. This fight isn't quite as fun as the Vengeance one though, and it's incredibly simplistic. You pretty much just try to dodge waves and other attacks that Blackout sends your way and wait for the point where he pulls out a bomb, then try and shoot it to damage him. It's kind of a narrow window to hit the bomb too, and there's no auto-aim, so it starts to feel incredibly redundant if you don't hit the bomb at the right time and have to repeat the whole loop again. It's not very exciting, and it feels kind of underwhelming especially since it doesn't even utilize Blackout's superpowers. In the comics, Blackout's thing is that he can suck all the light out of a room, leaving you surrounded in complete darkness. I know that's a tough power to pull off in a video game, since complete darkness isn't enjoyable for the player, but I'm sure there's a way to make a boss fight against Blackout compelling while also letting him use his powers, especially considering that they use that ability in the PSP version of the game. I think my main issue though is that this boss fight just feels so mundane that I'm wishing that the developers had done something extra to spice it up. But with Blackout defeated, Ghost Rider heads back to the city to check on Roxanne. Meanwhile, Blade tracks down Blackheart's body and takes out the surrounding demons. After claiming the body for himself, Blade locks it in a morgue, I think. I'm not exactly sure what he's doing with it here and it's never specified, but he's locked it up. Sweet dreams, Blackheart. Enjoy your beauty sleep. When Ghost Rider arrives in the city, he gets a bad feeling that Roxanne has been captured by demons. He also notices a strange bar fight occurring in town. Ghost Rider could sense the evil emanating from the body and knew that this was no ordinary bar fight. There was something bad in that bar. Whatever it was, he would make it tell him where Roxanne was. This leads into another bar fight level, but this time against a new enemy type, these undead bikers. I was nervous another bar fight might feel redundant, but these enemies are more challenging than the others we've faced so far, and they feel thematic to the environment, so I ended up enjoying this fight as well. I also think the design of this bar is much better than the last, with a lot more detail added to it. Even though my score at the end of the level is partially based on how quickly I run through it, I couldn't help but stroll around and admire all the little details of the room. I don't think there are any easter eggs or references in here though, aside from maybe the wanted posters on the walls. I'm guessing the faces on the wanted posters are some of the developers, but I don't know that for sure. Moving on though, we head outside and continue towards Mobile, Alabama. Once there, we fight our way through the city and into another abandoned building. Once we reach the top of the building, we're confronted by the air elemental. 
I actually like this design a lot more than the others, and I'm guessing this was his original design from the beginning, since it matches the look of that early wallow that we saw in the developer video. Like the others though, he's not too tough to take down, and we're able to claim the air soul. Now that we have the air soul, you guessed it, we backtrack through the last few levels to find the door blocked by air magic. Once we make it past that door, we make our way into an old church where we find the scarecrow holding Roxanne prisoner. Yeah. Roxanne! Johnny! <laughs> Such a sweetie. <laughs> I could just eat her up. <laughs> Roxanne! opinion. <laughs> How much more of this before she loses her luck? You will end this now. If you insist, Ghost Rider, but beware, there's more than bats in this belfry. <laughs> Scarecrow is probably the most unique boss fight in the game, or at least slightly more intricate. He'll start by sending his undead crows to fight you while he watches from the sidelines. This is actually thematic for Scarecrow in the comics, since he'll often use trained crows to attack others or defend him. But after beating the crows, Scarecrow will attempt to fight us. He's pretty easy to stunlock though, and after enough damage, he'll grapple up onto one of these columns and attack from above. From here, you have to figure out which column he's latched onto and shake it until he falls down. You'll repeat this another time or two until you fully defeat Scarecrow. You showed me. You saved the girl. Beat up on old Scarecrow. It's all for naught, I'm afraid. He's here already. <laughs> He's at the Quentin Carnival. You remember the carnival, don't you? Where your father... <laughs> Before we move on though, I do want to say that I love the design of Scarecrow here, and this was actually an original design from Climax Action. In one of the developer interviews, they mentioned how they redesigned Scarecrow and other enemies in the game to give them more modern looks, and I think they did an excellent job with all of them. Uh, one of the things about this project, it's been a really good fun for character development. One of the great things is that uh, Marvel's actually given us a, a lot of leeway. We've been able to take their own characters, they've allowed us to, to redesign their characters. Some of them are a bit more faithful and some we've actually uh, driven off in our own directions. You know, taking on the film's influence as well as the direction we want to push it in. So it's, it's been really good fun. As you can see with some of these guys, we're just about to have a look at. So one of the examples there is uh, Scarecrow. When we actually looked at the uh, comic version, he's, he's quite dated. You can see some from some of the artwork. Yeah. He's looking very uh, you know, monotone. Looks like some dude in pajamas there. We were lucky enough to actually um, take a lot of the themes that come from the movie because the movie's taken a real uh, western kind of a uh, horror take on the actual Ghost Rider universe. So that's something we took as inspiration for driving a lot of the characters. So our version of Scarecrow has taken on the western theme, a lot more of the horror has gone into it. We've really accentuated the, the real kind of psychotic side to the Scarecrow. Lilith's one of the other characters from the uh, Marvel Universe. Again, a good example of... Uh, she did actually get redesigned through the... Uh, Sort of comics, uh, she went through a whole range of changes, but something that was consistent was the, the large sort of V head, and she's a very kind of a dated vampire woman there. So, I think a good example of how we've made it a lot more contemporary, we've gone down, gone down this kind of a gothic uh, biker chick kind of look. One of the more encouraging things about the designs we've done here, Marvel have actually taken some of our own designs, uh, like Scarecrow, uh, Vengeance. They've actually uh, generated toys off our own designs, so uh, that's gone down pretty well. But with Scarecrow down, Ghost Rider leaves Roxanne here and heads towards Quentin Carnival, the old carnival where Johnny used to perform as a stunt rider. If I had to pick a favorite level in the game, I think I'd say it's this one. The level design is way more detailed compared to the previous levels, and I think they really nailed the spooky, rundown carnival vibe, and I love how it starts by making us walk through this creepy clown mouth to get in. That's just a taste of what's to come, since no horrific carnival is complete without creepy clowns, which just so happens to be the next enemy type that we're introduced to. The clowns are also pretty tough, especially the ones that drop bombs on the ground that you have to continually dodge. It can be a bit annoying, but I like how they make me focus on the environment more during fights. 
But after beating up a bunch of clowns, we head inside one of the carnival interiors, and this is where I think the design team had the most fun. There are a ton of animated details like the bouncing bat, and the skeletons that pop out of coffins, leading to a cinematic of hatchet-wielding clowns. <laughs> There are plenty of other little animated flourishes within this level, and I found it to be the most enjoyable one to explore. It just makes me wonder why the rest of the levels weren't this detailed. I know during one of the developer videos it was mentioned that a lot of these carnival details were included during the last four months of development, so maybe they realized they had extra time and enhanced this one level in particular. I don't know, but it's clearly the level with the most personality. As much as I love the level design of the carnival, it operates the same way as the previous levels. We'll fight our way through a ton of enemies until we find a pathway blocked off by some kind of magic. So we'll have to ride our bike somewhere far to find it. I do really like how detailed the backdrop of this bike sequence is though, since you get a good sense of how much the demons are progressing towards hell on earth, with buildings crumbling and falling, and all the debris left lying around. As far as our next destination though, we end up heading down to a bayou of all places to search for the next soul. The keeper of this soul is a swamp monster who's a lot more challenging than the previous soul carriers since he can stun you with a flurry of punches thanks to his multiple arms. After beating him though, we absorb the dark soul and backtrack all the way back to the Quentin Carnival. Once there, we take down the dark magic barricade and continue down that path. From here, we reach the climax of the game. You can come out. I know you're here. Just in time, Ghost Rider. For what exactly? The Apocalypse! The Apocalypse? I thought we were trying to stop the Apocalypse. Stop it? <laughs> oh no! Hell on Earth! A kingdom worth a million times more than the hole the angels have left for me. That is too good for me to pass on. So the angels... Right. I send demons to Earth, and they'd be down here in an instant. Takes longer than that to summon the portal. So I had to get someone else to do it for me. Someone with a good and true heart. Someone who always does the right thing. All the while, the angels look down. Oh! Look how Mephisto's servant gathers up the demons, exactly as he promised us, exactly according to the deal. <laughs> the journey I have sent you on, Ghost Rider, it was not an arbitrary wild goose chase. The hellfire of your cycle has been inscribing a glyph in the earth. Now it is complete. The walls between my domain and this will come crumbling down. Nothing can stop me. Hell on Earth will begin! But the wall still stands. Yes, there is one task yet remaining. Your demise. No! No! Mephisto. Uh-uh. You didn't think I'd stay locked up for long, did you? Father, son, it doesn't matter. I will destroy you both. Let's take this outside. Shall we dance again, Ryder? This ends now. Even after watching this cutscene a few times, I still don't understand what exactly is going on with Blackheart and how he shows up. He just seems to appear randomly even though we saw Blade lock him away earlier. I guess Blackheart was posing as Mephisto here and then reveals himself to really be Blackheart, or was it Mephisto that had been manipulating Ghost Rider all along? The reveal is so quick and convoluted that it's tough to tell and this is a moment that I think better quality cutscenes really would have helped make the twist more clear, but I think we're meant to believe that Blackheart was posing as Mephisto here. How he escaped from Blade's imprisonment, I have no idea, and it's just handled in a very hand-wavy way. We're not supposed to think about it. It also makes me wonder if they decided kind of last minute that Blade would be a playable character, and then tried to find ways to inject him into the story. Because really, he could have been cut out of the story completely, and the plot still would have made sense. 
The demons would have captured Blackheart's body after the train fight, and the next time we would have seen Blackheart would have been here, leaving us to assume the demons successfully resurrected him at the carnival while we were distracted by Blackout and Scarecrow. I'm not saying I want Blade cut out, I love that he appears, he just feels kind of unnecessary to the story, and it makes Blackheart's sudden appearance here feel more confusing and unexplained since we last saw him locked up. Regardless, Blackheart has somehow been resurrected, leading to our final boss fight against Giant Blackheart. Blackheart looks great and feels formidable thanks to his size, and I like that we're fighting on top of a destroyed building, but other than that, there's not much else to this fight. Blackheart will take a couple swipes at you and launch some energy blasts your way, but you pretty much just wait for him to slap his hands down and then blast the jewel on top of them. This leaves him vulnerable for Ghost Rider to slam his head down so that you can beat the hell out of it. It's not terrible, but it looks so awkward the way Blackheart just leaves his head laying on the ground for Ghost Rider to hit it. He's not pinned down in any way, so he could just lift his head up at any moment. It just looked a bit silly to me, but after reducing Blackheart's health down to a certain point, you'll start to break apart sections of the floor where you're standing. I did like this because it gave you less room to dodge around, which made those energy blasts more challenging, but it's still a rinse and repeat style boss fight for Blackheart. Once he's defeated though, we get our final cutscene. Stand back, Ghost Rider. You've done enough. Why? He betrayed you yet again, you fool. He is my sire. Keep out of my domain. I think not. Until the next time. You okay? I am now. Was that- Yeah, Mephisto. Is he gone? For now, he'll be back. Then let's enjoy today while we can. So Johnny won more time for himself, for Roxanne, for everyone. He knows that evil will rise again, and that when it does, the Ghost Rider must be there to stand against it. But until then, he has some living to do. And that ends the story of Ghost Rider. It was a surprisingly short story and maybe took me around 5 hours to beat. As far as how good the story was overall, it was okay. There wasn't much to it and mostly served for us to travel around to random places. A lot of things didn't really make sense either, especially regarding Blackheart and that ending, but I at least like that it introduced a variety of Ghost Rider villains without trying to stick too close to the movie. After playing the Punisher game last video and knowing that it was also written by Ennis and Palmiotti, I'm definitely disappointed with what we got for Ghost Rider. Punisher was such a fun and engaging story where Ghost Rider feels like it was put together in a day. I don't blame Ennis and Palmiotti for that either. Instead, I think their work was another casualty of a rushed game with minimal resources. In fact, hearing the ideas that Ennis originally had for the game's story makes me wish even more that we could have seen a game that followed that initial vision. Still, I don't hate the story, it just ended up feeling bland and forgettable. But the story is only a minor part of this game, so let's discuss how the gameplay was executed. Ghost Rider arrives at the station, just in time. Time for him to do what he does best. <laughs> Too late, Ryder. We have Blackheart's body, and soon he will be restored. We will rule over hell on Earth as king and queen. Not a chance. I will destroy you! The combat essentially boils down to performing a variety of combos for as long as you can without getting hit by the enemy. This will increase your vengeance bar, which will in turn enhance your score and help you to build up your link charge. The link charge is an ability you can use when this green tank is filled all the way, and triggering it causes Ghost Rider to do a massive area of effect attack. On normal mode, this will one-shot pretty much every enemy you encounter except for bosses. You also have this spirit gauge which indicates how many rounds you have left for your Hellfire shotgun. If you let the spirit gauge fill up all the way, you can trigger something called Retribution, where you have increased speed and strength. If you want to get real fancy, you can grab an enemy while in Retribution mode and perform a Penance Stare. This forces an enemy to stare into Ghost Rider's eyes and feel all the pain that they've caused to others over the course of their life. It's an incredibly powerful finishing move and gives Ghost Rider a massive amount of souls which can be used to buy upgrades. So that's the basis of the combat in Ghost Rider. It's pretty fun and provides you with some variety with how to approach a group of enemies, 
but it gets repetitive pretty fast. Even though there are a lot of combos you can unlock over the course of the game, there isn't much of a point in utilizing all of them. You can mostly button mash your way through the game or just stick with a select few combos that you like. Some of the combos are really fun to pull off and have cool animations, specifically the one where Ghost Rider pulls out his Hellfire shotgun, but none of them are necessary for getting through a level. Since this game is more of a button masher, the combat can start to get stale pretty early on in the game, and I felt like I was sleepwalking through a lot of these combat scenarios. I thought that maybe my problem was that normal mode was a bit too easy for me, so I tried a couple of the harder difficulties to see if that changed things, and it did a little bit, but not as much as I hoped. In hard mode, I liked the added challenge and found myself dodging and blocking a lot more while planning certain combos. Enemies do a lot more damage and have increased health, so it did cause me to think through fights more than I did in normal mode. However, the difficulty ramp from normal to hard felt higher than I anticipated. I struggled to get through some of these earlier levels on hard, while normal mode felt pretty casual. There's definitely more skill required for hard mode, so if you're enjoying the combat in Ghost Rider and want to test yourself, the harder difficulties will provide that, but it really didn't add much more enjoyment for me. If anything, it felt like it was prolonging fights while adding a much smaller margin of error. I'm not quite sure why the combat wasn't clicking for me, but I think it ultimately just wasn't engaging me and I never felt addicted to the combat the way that I hoped I would. Even though the combat can be satisfying and it feels good knocking enemies around with Ghost Rider's chains, that satisfaction would wear off throughout my play sessions. I often noticed that I enjoyed the game most when I first turned it on and faced my first few waves of enemies. It was thrilling beating up demons and Ghost Rider felt powerful, but that feeling went away the longer I played. I think it's because I always felt like I was doing the same things during combat no matter the difficulty. Chain combos together amongst waves of enemies while trying not to get hit. I think this was a concern the developers had with the combat too, since it seems like there are a few enemies that were implemented to try and prevent that. One of the most notorious examples of this is the Vengeance Bar Sphere that will surround some enemies. Enemies can be knocked around while in this sphere, but they won't take any damage. In order to break it, you need to reach the required Vengeance Bar status and then hit them. To increase the Vengeance Bar, you have to perform a variety of different combos, so on paper, this sounds good as a way to stop players from button mashing the same combos over and over again, but in practice, it was more frustrating than fun. Later in the game, you'll come across enemies with the Vengeance rating, the highest rating, and it can feel like a real grind trying to break them out of these spheres. I eventually found that the best way to do it was to get as much of a combo as I could, and then use the Link Charge. The Link Charge boosts the Vengeance Bar by a significant amount, and usually this was enough to reach the required status. So even though I wasn't a fan of the Vengeance Bar Sphere, I appreciate that they tried to implement ways to get us thinking about the combos more, but this one didn't land for me. There were a couple enemy types that I think did a better job though, specifically the Undead Bikers and the Death Watch Ninjas. The ninjas will often block with their swords and you won't be able to break through that block unless you use certain combos or your Hellfire shotgun. This forced me to use specific combos that I knew would break their block or just pull out the shotgun to open them up. Taking it to the next level are the Undead Bikers who not only block, but they also counter your attacks. I was sleepwalking through the combat so much that it took me a while to realize that they were countering me when in the blocking stance, and it woke me up to thinking through the combat a lot more when they were around. Even though these are just small examples, I think they were steps in the right direction towards making the combat more engaging. While we're on the topic of different enemy types, I want to talk about projectile enemies and the camera. As you progress the game, you'll come across new enemy types that not only rush you, but some that stay in the back and lob projectiles at you. I like this enemy variety, but the camera makes those enemies more frustrating than they should be. For whatever reason, you can't control the camera in this game. Instead, it'll follow you around and try to intuitively maneuver itself based on where you're at and what you're doing. The camera never got stuck or did anything weird, but I really needed to be able to move the camera around to gauge the battlefield. Those ranged enemies made this especially necessary because you can't see them when they spawn in. So even if you're performing a great series of combos the way the game wants you to, you'll often get tagged with a random projectile that you couldn't have anticipated, resetting your combo meter. So being able to swing the camera around where I needed would have been really handy. There were even times where I thought I completed the fight, only to have some random enemy off in the distance that I couldn't see. Trying to get to them was an issue too, because I would have to just run around in a big circle to try and find leftover enemies, instead of just simply turning the camera around. All that to say, I would have really appreciated the inclusion of a controllable camera, and it would have saved me some unnecessary frustration during fights. While we're on the topic of combat, we should also talk about the upgrade store titled Caretaker Shop. The Caretaker is a character from both the comics and the movie, and he's also the one narrating the story of the game and the cutscenes. In his shop, we can spend the souls we've obtained on things like new combos, health, shotgun damage, etc. These were fun upgrades to get and enhance the experience, but I would have appreciated more of them. You can probably unlock all of these gameplay-related upgrades before you're halfway through the story. 
So as cool as it was to get these upgrades, the store ended up feeling pretty lackluster overall. I also would have liked one minor quality of life change in here too, which would have been to view the combos you've purchased. As it stands, you want to try and memorize the combo you're getting before you buy it, since when you purchase it, it shows the next combo immediately. So if you don't remember which one you bought, you have to back all the way out and go into a different menu that shows you all the combos you've unlocked so far, and hunt for it. It would have been much nicer to be able to view the upgrades that I purchased already in the same menu. I also would have really liked for them to change or remove the caretaker's voice lines from the shop. You'll often end up with a ton of souls and the capability to buy multiple upgrades or collectibles at one time. This can be fun, but the downside is that they only gave the caretaker like four lines for when you buy something, so you'll often hear him say the same things over and over again. Enjoy. 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 There you go. There you go. Enjoy. Enjoy. Done. After hearing that, it's no wonder why Garth Ennis was so keen to torture the caretaker in those early drafts. All jokes aside, I think they would have been better off removing those caretaker voice lines from the shop and just sticking with the sound effects. Going back to some of the core gameplay, the missions will often alternate between a combat-centered level and a motorcycle level. I actually enjoyed the motorcycle levels quite a bit, even though each bike mission is pretty much the same. You'll ride through an obstacle course while shooting and running over enemies on the road, attack other bike riding enemies, and make large jumps over gaps or slide under obstacles. These missions are pretty simple in concept, but there's something sort of relaxing and satisfying about them. They're also pretty quick missions, maybe taking about 2-5 to five minutes each to complete. I enjoyed it though, and I can tell the developers took a lot of time to make the bike handle right and feel smooth. If I had one complaint, it's that I wish they had gone farther with it. Some of the most enjoyable bike missions were the ones towards the end of the game where they start throwing more obstacles at you. For example, having to jump onto a narrow piece of debris or slide under multiple objects in quick succession. Those kept me on my toes and were pretty exciting, so I think it could have been fun if Climax Action added more obstacles or challenge to some of the bike levels. Still, that's a minor nitpick and I think the bike missions were really fun. Overall though, I didn't hate the combat in the game. And I should give credit where credit is due, because Sam Barlow also mentioned how their goal for the game was for it to be more of a casual fighting game, where you can come home after a stressful day and just beat up enemies. I think with Ghost Rider we've got a nice balance where, as you go through the game, you actually feel like you're becoming more and more powerful, like a superhero. It's much more about letting the player have fun, letting the player feel really powerful against all these stupid enemies. Another aspect I'm really, really happy with is, is the kind of the fighting engine that we've developed and how that feels to play. You know, the game's all about stress management. Come home from a hard day at work, turn on Ghost Rider, power it up, bam, hitting guys, bam, hitting guys. You pick up the controller, you press bang, someone gets hit, bang again, someone else gets hit. You know, whenever you press a button, instantly you want something to happen. And, and that's the kind of game it is, and I think it works like that. The game certainly works on that front and is probably best played that way, so I can't fault them for that, but I personally wanted a little bit more depth to the game and its combat. For what it was though, I was able to enjoy it and there were definitely satisfying moments within the game. For example, it always felt good taking down large groups of enemies with a well-timed link charge or pulling off a string of combos during a tense level, and I enjoyed challenging myself to get better. It's not a terrible system, but I think I ultimately just wanted more out of it. This is the place. This is where they brought the body. I'm coming in. Any unholy fools want to try and stop me? Let's dance. Nothing like a nice workout to relax at the end of a long, hard day. Now, Blackheart, son of the demon Lord Mephisto, me and you are going to take a little ride. Sweet dreams, Blackheart. Enjoy your beauty sleep. Like I've mentioned, Ghost Rider is a really short game and you could probably beat it in an afternoon. However, the developers of Climax Action attempted to remedy this by giving it some additional replay value. Once you beat the game for the first time, you'll unlock some new outfits and a new difficulty, Extreme Mode. As much as I've mentioned wanting more challenge out of Normal Mode, I definitely couldn't handle Extreme Mode. Not because it's bad, but because it kicks my ass. I couldn't even get through level 1. I also struggled in hard mode though, so take that for what you will. But if you're addicted to the gameplay of Ghost Rider and want to get the ultimate challenge of it, you'll definitely want to try out Extreme Mode. While trying out this new difficulty, you can also equip one of three new outfits. 
To start, you can play as Vengeance, the first villain we encountered in the game. If it seems weird to play as a villain, this is actually thematic with the comics. Vengeance started as an antagonist towards Ghost Rider due to Mephisto manipulating Vengeance. Once he learned of this, he became an ally, even becoming a member of the Midnight Suns. So he's not all bad, and I think he was an awesome inclusion here. They also did a phenomenal job with his character design. Another outfit is Ghost Rider 2099, probably my least favorite of the new outfits, but still a cool inclusion. Then if you can beat the game on extreme difficulty, you can unlock the classic Ghost Rider outfit. You may be wondering how I'm using this outfit right now even though I just said I couldn't make it past level 1 on extreme. Well, for lame asses like myself, some games include cheat modes to help, so I basically turned on all cheats and grinded the entire game out in god mode. It took only a couple hours and the game was nice enough to still let me unlock the outfit. I'm really glad it did, because this might be my favorite outfit in the game. You don't get any additional perks for using it, it's just a new skin, but I think it looks really good. For each of those characters, they also came with their own custom bike skin, which I think was another cool touch. Lastly, there is one more character that you unlock after beating the game, and that's Blade. Unlike the others I just mentioned, he's not just a skin, but instead has his own unique combat and animations. This is easily the most exciting unlockable in the game, and it was really cool getting to play as Blade in a Ghost Rider game. He plays quite a bit differently too. One big change is how he acquires health. Ghost Rider has to stand near fire and absorb it for health, where Blade leans into his vampiric roots. To get health back for Blade, you need to stun an enemy and bite them to drain the health back. It's a pretty cool feature and it's thematic for Blade, so I like it a lot. I think I actually like this method better than Ghost Riders 2, because you can regain health on the spot instead of having to find a random flame somewhere. So if you're really getting beat up out there, you can recover a lot easier with Blade. Another change is that Blade doesn't have a Link Charge or Shotgun ability, he's solely dependent on his sword. It sucks he doesn't have any extra abilities, but the good news is, is that he's an incredibly fast and agile fighter. So you can string together a lot more hits with the sword than you ever could with Ghost Rider's Chain. The downside though is that they only gave Blade a limited number of combos. Even stranger, you can't see what his combos are in the menu, so you really have to button mash to try and figure them out. I also hope that maybe you could get Blade specific upgrades in Caretaker Shop, but you can only buy collectibles. This is where my excitement for playing as Blade started to wane. Ghost Rider was repetitive, but he at least had a Link Charge, Pennant Stare, and Shotgun to mix things up. Blade doesn't have anything except his sword. I was having a blast at first, but once I realized there was no additional combat potential for Blade, and that he was even more button mashy than Ghost Rider, he started to get stale really quick. Even more though, I began to notice that I was better off just spamming his light attacks instead of using combos. The more I tried to input combos, the more he would get interrupted. He's so quick with his light attacks that if you just spam square, you can pretty much beat everything. So yeah, as much as I loved seeing Blade in the game and getting to play as him, he unfortunately left a lot to be desired and felt incomplete. They didn't even take the time to change some of the Ghost Rider specific animations in the story for Blade, making some scenes look really goofy. Regardless of how I felt Blade was executed, I admire that they were passionate enough about the game and the characters to put Blade in, and I think Blade, as well as the other unlockables, helped to add some much needed replayability to the game. While we're talking about extras though, let's look at the remaining inventory in Caretaker's shop. We talked about the gameplay upgrades, but a lot of the store is aimed at collectibles such as concept art, developer interviews, and comics. There are a lot of these in the shop, and you can spend a lot of souls just on collectibles. As someone who is doing a retrospective on the game, I found the developer interviews to be very valuable, but as someone who's just playing the game, these collectibles probably aren't very exciting. I'm surprised how much of the store is comprised of collectibles, but I think they're mostly here as filler. Like I mentioned earlier, I was able to unlock all the gameplay upgrades halfway into the game, leaving just collectibles to buy. I'm glad there was something to spend souls on, but I really would have preferred more gameplay enhancing upgrades. Both Vengeance and Ghost Rider 2099 are unlocked after beating the game, which is great, but you could have had them both as outfits in the shop and left Blade as the game completion reward. Or even just having some minor additional upgrades to help pad the shop would have been nice. Something like a couple extra damage buffs or an upgrade that helps you move through the vengeance bar faster, you get my point. Just having a few more extra upgrades would have helped because the caretaker shop didn't really feel that exciting and there were a lot of times I forgot it even existed. That being said, the collectibles we did get are worth unlocking and perusing. The concept arts are pretty cool to look at, and I've enjoyed the developer interviews a lot since they give some fun insight into the game and development in general. One in particular spends time showing the different phases that the Ghost Rider game went through and what those stages look like. So, uh, what you're looking at here is uh, like one week into Ghost Rider production where we're literally getting the very first bike 
physics handling up and running and some really early uh, bike rider combat here we're just experimenting with what might work from a gameplay perspective we've got really early AI guys on bikes trying to work out how we can get them to react to the small input changes that a player can make here you can see we've got very early combat and, and, and player character movement you can see it's a really early iteration of Ghost Rider he's looking really like a bean pole the fire in his head is is really not working it's not looking very good this character went through about five different iterations before the final game you see really early combat here sort of early aerial moves there's no weapon trails or special effects on the character literally we're just trying to work out how to detect collisions how to make the AI work you can see here really early hard and now we start to layer in some special effects this is about a month or so into the project you've got some really early demon essence being picked up here you can see the grey box transition through to an environment that is not a complete environment yet and you'll see better versions of these later in the game the blue textures there on Ghost Rider we had to change Marvel didn't like the use of blue there they, 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 they didn't feel it was in keeping with Ghost Rider so we, we were asked to change it to the red that's in the final game. Here's a version of the carnival. There's there's a lot of special effects and detail missing from this level that appears in the final game. The sky isn't there and the lack of bloom as well. So although it's starting to look a little bit nicer now and starting to look more like a proper game, that we're still actually only about six months in development here and there's a hell of a lot more polish needed to be added to make it final. Here's a good example of the grey box turning into an early version of the level and turning into the final version of that bar. It looks um, a lot more detail and shadows and move, moving shadows added to that level. Again here, the big wheel you can see lacks detail and then you know special effects, sky and bloom added makes the whole thing look really special. This is where we started to add cinematic moments into the game uh, to introduce enemies to the player, so new enemies are introduced in, in cool ways. Loads of animated environment objects in this room. All this stuff was layered in in kind of the last four months of development. The unlockable comics are also pretty cool in their own way. In most games, you only unlock the cover of issues, but in this game, you can read through them. You only get to read through a select few pages of each issue, but it's still cool nonetheless. I'm sure this was aimed at being a teaser for Marvel Comics in hopes that you would go buy the rest of the issue, but I still find it really interesting. There are a ton of different comics to unlock here too, and I think I spent most of my souls obtaining them. So even though I would have liked for the Caretaker Shop to have a more substantial inventory, primarily related to gameplay features, I like what was provided and I enjoyed going through them. But next I want to talk about the PSP version of the game because I think it provides some interesting differences from the console version. The first difference is that there's actually a really cool multiplayer component to it where you can play a Mario Kart style racing mode. Within it, there are a ton of playable characters that you can't play as anywhere else in the game like Johnny Blaze, Caretaker, and all the game's villains. It even includes Death Watch who was only mentioned during the main game but never made an appearance. For whatever reason, he's a playable character in the racing mode, but I'm not complaining. Also, each character has their own stats and offensive abilities, and they each have their own unique bike. You can also choose new levels to race on like the Daily Bugle or the Avengers base. During the race, it functions a lot like Mario Kart where you'll pick up ability orbs to give you an advantage. Some of them are offensive blasts to stun other racers, or there are things like speed boosts, turning the screen black against the other racers, or flipping their screen. It's a really fun idea even if it's a complete ripoff, but it really fits well here. As far as how fun it is, it's about as fun as you'd expect. Once the novelty of a Ghost Rider Mario Kart mode wears off, it becomes pretty repetitive, but I imagine it's a lot more fun when you're playing against real people. Regardless, it's a really fun idea and it's a mode unique to the PSP. Another unique aspect of the PSP version is a chapter select with challenges. The PSP story mode doesn't seamlessly transition from level to level the way the console version does, so you play each level in combat segments. But for each one, you're given three challenges to try and complete. For example, collect at least 1400 souls, complete within three minutes, and perform 15 grab kills. You don't need to complete each of these to progress the story, but each one you do complete earns you a skull, which act as points that you can redeem in the caretaker shop instead of souls. I think I still like the soul version of points better, but I like the idea of introducing level challenges for players who are looking for some extra replayability or an opportunity to challenge themselves. After beating a level, you can come back to this menu and replay the level again for fun, or try and beat another one of those challenges. 
Since the game is aimed at being a casual experience for people to play and unwind in, I'm surprised the console version doesn't have a chapter select feature. Some levels in the story were definitely more memorable, challenging, and fun to play overall, and I think it could have been fun to revisit some of those. Add in some of these additional challenges and the player will have some extra replayability options. It's not going to make or break the game, but for the players that are really engaged in Ghost Rider's combat, I'm sure they would have appreciated that kind of flexibility instead of having to run through the entire story again. But overall, the PSP version has some unique features and good ideas, some of which I would have liked to have seen implemented into the console version as well. In his fury, Ghost Rider had laid waste to legions of Hell's abominations. But he had yet to discover a route out of the Infernal Kingdom. It was time for Mephisto to play his hand. Going somewhere, Ghost Rider? Mephisto! Not thinking of leaving, I hope. If you want to leave, it will be on my terms. I don't think so. Listen. Blackheart's plan almost succeeded, and the Horde of Hell has risen from my kingdom to finish what he could not. They are running loose on the surface world, beyond even my control. Their presence in the world of mortals breaks the very laws of heaven and hell. Soon they will trigger the apocalypse. You must bring them back, or it will be the end of everything. Why me? I have a pact with the angels in heaven. If I cannot control my kingdom, they will take it from me. Rule number one, no demons on earth. This is a job for the Ghost Rider. No one else. And what if I tell you to? Did you hear what I said? The end of everything. All you ever cared about. One soul in particular. Roxanne. She dies tonight, Ghost Rider. Uh, no! Vengeance, go! Find Roxanne Simpson! Bring her to me! Vengeance, you're mine. You've got no chance in hell if you away. Despite this being a movie tie-in game, none of the actors from the film returned to reprise their role in the game. I was surprised by this though, because there are a couple of characters that sounded like they were legitimately voiced by the film's actors. Primarily the caretaker, played by Sam Elliott in the movie. I was convinced Sam was voicing his character here, but it was actually a different actor, Fred Tadasior. I think Fred did an excellent job replicating Sam Elliott's voice as caretaker, and I was really impressed by that. This won't be the last time we talk about Fred in one of these retrospectives either, because as I was looking through his work history, I noticed that he's had a hand in a ton of different Marvel games. I won't go through each one now, but he seems to predominantly play the Hulk in Marvel media, such as in Hulk Ultimate Destruction, the Incredible Hulk game, as well as in the show Earth's Mightiest Heroes. Some other notable comic book roles that he's had include Crossbones in the War for Wakanda DLC in Marvel's Avengers, Bane in Batman Arkham Asylum, and he'll also be playing Hitmonkey when that show releases. He's even had experience playing Ghost Rider recently in Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3. Not even the fire of hell itself can contain me. When there is vengeance to be delivered. I'm only scratching the surface of Fred's resume here, so keep an eye out for that name to show up more in future retrospectives. Speaking of familiar faces, Steve Bloom has a role in this game as well, playing Vengeance. I don't think there's been one retrospective that I've done so far that hasn't included Steve in there somehow. If you're unfamiliar with him, he's most popular for his work as Wolverine, voicing him in games such as the X-Men Legends series and all three Marvel Ultimate Alliance games. He's an incredibly talented voice actor and I'm always pleased to see his name in the cast list of a game we're covering. Also, I only just found out that I'd been pronouncing his name wrong this entire series. It's not Steve Blum, it's Steve Bloom. So yeah, I'm very sorry about that, Steve. The last performance I want to briefly discuss, though, is the voice of Scarecrow, performed by Dave Wittenberg. I'm not familiar with any of Dave's work outside of this game, but Scarecrow was definitely one of my highlights throughout the story. I think he made Scarecrow sound very maniacal and unhinged, something incredibly fitting for his character and design. If you insist, Ghost Rider, but beware, there's more than bats in this belfry! <laughs> I think Scarecrow's voice was the most memorable for me, and I really enjoyed that portrayal. Continuing on though, let's listen to some of the musical score from the Ghost Rider game. Today, I have four tracks here that I think most embody the best aspects of the music in Ghost Rider. Starting off, we'll begin with the track that plays while we're going through the first motorcycle mission, since it not only fits well with that mission, but also displays the aggressive and fast-paced nature of the game.
Most of the tracks in the game are some kind of rock theme, but next I want to play a track that slows things down and provides a lot of atmosphere. This plays during the San Venganza level, and I think it's perfect for that spooky old western feel. Next up is another motorcycle level track, this one also taking place in San Venganza. I don't have much to say about this one other than I think it's really cool and exciting. Lastly is the track that plays during your boss fight against Lilith, Mother of Demons. It's a great track for a boss fight and I think it would fit nicely in a workout playlist. Overall, I thought the audio was pretty solid in the game, from the soundtrack to the voice performances. The soundtrack fit especially well with the fast-paced, hack-and-slash nature of the game, so I have no complaints there. The voice acting was good too, even though there was hardly any dialogue in the game, aside from the cutscenes. Regardless, I can't complain about the audio. <laughs> Vengeance defeated, Ghost Rider races for the surface. Out of the frying pan and into the fire, so to speak. You made short work of vengeance, but my servants are many. You cannot oppose my will. I'll do it. For Roxanne and nothing else. And go, proceed to San Venganza. Hunt down the demons and seal the rift between the worlds forever. Either Lilith or the Rider. Tonight, one must fall. <laughs> I'm not sure what to think about Ghost Rider the game. On the one hand, I could see how many players could get a lot of enjoyment out of it since the combat can be satisfying and the bike missions are pretty smooth. After all, the goal was for it to be a casual hack and slash game that you could pick up for a couple hours and unwind with. On the other hand, I felt kind of disappointed after beating it. Although the combat can be satisfying, that satisfaction was short lived for me and started to get repetitive after the first few levels. It was also an incredibly short game, probably averaging around 4 to 6 hours for most players. However, after seeing that it didn't release as a full price game, I can't really fault it for its length. Most PS2 era games release at around $40 to $50, while Ghost Rider released at $30. That being said, I still find it difficult to say that what we received was fulfilling. It took me about 5 hours to beat the game my first time, and although I was surprised to see it wrapping up already, I was kind of okay with it. To me, that's a bad indicator. At the end of a game, I should feel bummed out that it's over, while also wishing it would keep going. But here I felt content with it being done. So my problem isn't the length of the game, but more how I felt throughout it. The combat had exciting moments and some of the enemies were engaging, but I felt like I was doing the same things over and over again. Not only just with the combat, but with the missions too. The layout of the missions were always the same. Find a door that's blocked with some kind of magic at the beginning of a level, then spend the next few levels fighting waves of enemies and riding the bike until you beat an elemental monster that gives you the magic to unlock that pathway. Then backtrack through those same levels until you reach the door you started at to progress to the next set of levels. There was so much backtracking and repetition in this game, and I think that was one of my biggest problems. 
It's disappointing too, because after watching the developer interviews, it's clear that there were people on the team who had a lot of passion for what they were making and had a lot of creative ideas, but were hindered by a rushed release deadline. This was slightly alluded to in an interview with lead artist Neil Williams, where he describes a level that the team were really bummed to cut out due to time constraints. Because of the scope of the project and the tight time frame, there were a few casualties along the way. Probably the most lamented by the team was a level set amongst the windswept cornfields and trailer parks of a mythic American Midwest, culminating in an epic battle in an old disused barn being literally ripped apart by a rampaging storm. The level described there actually sounds pretty cool and even though I said I didn't need more levels in the game, I would have liked to have seen what the team had in store for it. It sounds really atmospheric and could have been one of the highlights of the game. Regardless, the rush timeline of the game definitely hurt its success, in my opinion. I've used the Punisher game as an example a couple times now, but I see it and Ghost Rider as two games that started off in similar places but were executed completely differently. Both games were movie tie-ins that took place after the events of the movie, and both were written by Ennis and Palmiotti. However, each ended up receiving different levels of success. I think Punisher ended up being one of the best Marvel games of that era, while Ghost Rider ended up fading into obscurity. Those may not be completely accurate comparisons, but when I look at Punisher, I see a game that was given the necessary time and resources to allow the creators of the game to realize their vision. For Ghost Rider, I see it as a game that was rushed from the beginning and given a small budget, with its main goal being to cash in on the hype of the movie. This leaves the game feeling very hollow, and I can't help but think about what this Ghost Rider game could have been like had it been given extra development time and more creative freedom. Had it been given those resources, maybe they could have spent more time on the combat to make it really compelling. Even though I've been kinda hard on the combat here, there are elements that I think are enjoyable, but I need it to go further. Add in more necessary combos and upgrades and give me a reason to use specific combos against challenging enemies. If this game could have moved beyond Button Masher and inject more elements of strategy into the combat, I think I'd be a lot more into it. The same thing goes for Blade. I love the idea to include an entirely different playable character as a reward, and as fun as he is to use, he feels incomplete. I wish Climax had been given extra time to flesh out Blade and give him some additional combos and unique upgrades. Even though I don't think I've ever seen him using shotguns in the comics, I know he uses other guns against enemies, so I would have loved to have seen him use some kind of 3 round burst fire pistol in place of Ghost Rider shotgun, just to add some additional thematic options to his combat. With a bigger budget, we could have also swapped out those really cheap comic panel cutscenes for Blur Studios crafted cinematics, similar to games like Punisher and Marvel Ultimate Alliance 1. They're expensive, but they really grab your attention and elevate the story. Speaking of the story, maybe we could have gotten a more involved narrative that could include all the elements Climax Studios were forced to leave out, for example that Midwest level, or all the villains Sam Barlow mentions wishing he could have included. I think for me the one I really wanted to see in there was Zodiac. He was this kind of green guy with a big cigar, who was a serial killer superhero. We wanted to get some of the cooler Lillian in there. Um, we kind of paid tribute to them with the actual uh, Lillian side beast character who's in the game. Death Watch turns up on the PSP and multiplayer, I'd have loved to have seen him in there as a boss fight. And probably for me, the one character who I absolutely wanted in the game and isn't in the game and would definitely be in there if there was a sequel um, was Death Ninja. He was one of um, Death Watch's ninjas, but he died and he came back again. And he was this weird supernatural zombie ninja. To me, that's the epitome of a game character. I really would have liked to have seen Climax's true vision for Ghost Rider come to pass because it's clear they have a lot of passion for the character and had a lot of creative ideas. Some of my favorite parts in the game are when they were able to inject additional personality and creativity into the levels. For example, anytime Ghost Rider comes across some kind of barricade, he'll come up with a Ghost Rider specific solution to the problem, and they're often really humorous. The carnival was easily my favorite level because there was so much creativity and visual flourishes within the level design. You could tell they were having a lot of fun during this level, and I wish they had the time to do the same in all the other ones. My point is, there is a great game lying within Ghost Rider 2007, but we didn't get that. It wasn't for a lack of skill or creativity, but instead, due to high-level studio greediness and just wanting to pump out a quick cash grab, regardless of if a good game could be made or not. It's incredibly disappointing, but it's also incredibly common with movie tie-in games. 
Ghost Rider is such an awesome character and he deserves a game that really lives up to his potential. Sadly, this game isn't it. It's not terrible, but I definitely wanted more from it. After viewing the Metacritic scores, I don't think I'm alone, since these scores are somewhat middling. The critic reviews are currently sitting at an average of 54, with a user score of 69. Usually in these videos, I see myself as an easy grader always giving higher review scores, but here I'm actually going to go a little bit lower than the critics and give it a 5 out of 10. To me, Ghost Rider is an average game, and although there's some fun to be had playing as Ghost Rider and even as Blade, it left me feeling unfulfilled and wishing there was more substance to it. There hasn't been another solo Ghost Rider game after this one, so if you're a Ghost Rider fan, I'd still say it's worth checking out if you can do it for cheap. Otherwise, you're probably not missing out on much. It does seem to be selling on Amazon for pretty reasonable prices, so I'll leave a link in the description if you'd like to check it out for yourself. But those are my thoughts on the Ghost Rider game. Next up, I think it's definitely time to start getting into some Spider-Man games, especially with the No Way Home movie coming up. So the next game I plan to visit will be Spider-Man Shattered Dimensions, another Spider-Verse style story with multiple playable Spider-Men. I actually never got to play this when it first came out, so I'm extremely excited to give it a try. It's amongst one of the most requested games that I've seen in the comments, and from what I've heard, it's a pretty solid game. So that's what's coming up next. If you have suggestions for other retrospectives you'd like to see in the future, definitely let me know in the comments below. And if you'd like to discuss all things Marvel with myself and other fans, you can join us on Discord. The link is in the description below. But anyway, thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.